Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Sinjin International Second Quarter Ended September 2022 Financial Results Conference Call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Ms. Avantika Mishra from EY. Thank you and over to you. Thank you, Yashasri, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this call to discuss Sinjin's Q2 FY23 financial and business performance. From the management side, we have Mr. Jonathan Hunt, MD and Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Sibaji Biswas, Chief Financial Officer, and Dr. Mahesh Bhalgat, Chief Operating Officer. Post opening remarks from the management side, we will open the line for Q&A and will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Before we begin, I would like to caution that comments made during this conference call today will contain certain forward-looking statements and must be viewed in relation to the risk pertaining to the business. The safe harbor clause indicated in the investor presentation also applies to this conference call. The replay of this call will be available for the next few days and the transcript will be subsequently made available. With this, I now hand over the call to Mr. Jonathan Hunt. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you and thank you to those joining us on the call today to discuss Sinjin's performance in the second quarter and first half of the year. I'll start by commenting on the headline numbers, then move to some of the operational and strategic highlights for the quarter um, and for the year. Sabadji so will provide a more detailed insight into the financials in his remarks. I think like all businesses, we're keeping a keen eye on the broader economic environment, including concerns over global economic growth, potential for ongoing slide, supply disruption, rising energy costs or geopolitics. I think despite those concerns, I really would reiterate that the second quarter and the first half of the year has been a positive demand environment for Sinjin. We continue to see good demand in the main client markets of the US and Europe. That's helped us deliver strong revenue growth and puts us on track to meet our guidance for the rest of the year. So looking at the specifics of the second quarter, uh, the quarter was characterized by positive performances across all four divisions. Revenue from operations grew 26% to 768 crore um, over the corresponding quarter last year. Reported EBITDA was up 22% to 232 crore rupees. Profit after tax, PAT, before an exceptional item was up 11% over the corresponding quarter to 102 crore rupees. Now, the, exce the exceptional item was a one-time downward adjustment of 25 crore rupees in the second quarter of last year on account of the government's decision during that quarter to cap the Services Export Incentive Scheme, the SEIS scheme for research and development services at a five crore cap for the financial year. The performance during the second quarter was robust and came on the back of a strong first quarter. You may recall that we upgraded our financial guidance for the year last quarter, and against this, we've delivered a first half in line with these higher expectations, and I think this positions as well for the full year. So just turning now to each of the operating divisions, start with Discovery Services. Overall performance during the quarter for Discovery Services was good. We're seeing a healthy demand environment as clients continue to make up the ground they lost during the pandemic, as, as well as bring new projects forward. This positive demand was most pronounced in Discovery Chemistry, where we saw some of the uh, strongest demand we've seen in recent quarters. Our second campus in Hyderabad played an increasingly important role in Discovery Chemistry operations, now grown to over 600 scientists, and we've got more expansion plans there in Hyderabad. During the quarter of the proprietary integrated drug discovery platform, Synvent continued to gain traction. That portfolio currently stands at 18 integrated programs. And I think we continue to see good demand for that sort of fully integrated research approach. In dedicated centers, 
Um, as part of the partnership with BMS, we've fully commissioned and now operationalized a new state-of-the-art translational medicine library, uh, laboratory to help BMS um, accelerate the discovery of new therapies. Growth in our development services business was predominantly from repeat orders from existing clients, as well as an increase in the number of collaborations with emerging biopharma companies. In the last two and a half years, while we've sustained the collaborations we have with 15 of the top 20 biopharma companies globally, our partnerships with clients in that small and medium-sized biotech sector continues to accelerate. So now just looking at the manufacturing side of the business, over the past few years, I think we've made some important investments in establishing our biologics manufacturing capacity. This groundwork really paved the way for the 10-year agreement we signed with Zoetis in the first quarter, and that's to manufacture the drug substance for the labrella. That's a monoclonal antibody for use in animal health. Now, while lots of work is ongoing, the key progress indicators in the second quarter were the completion of the process performance qualification batches for commercial manufacturing, and of course the preparations for the expected regulatory inspections. Subject to the successful completion of the required regulatory audits, we anticipate that manufacturing of the drug substance is likely to begin in the fourth quarter of, the, of this financial year, and therefore that means it becomes a factor for your modeling of revenue from the start of the next financial year. I'll leave it to Sabaji to comment further on that um, if needed. And finally, just to preempt a question that comes up each quarter, our small molecule manufacturing facility in Mangalore is on track to obtain the key regulatory approvals around the mid of the next financial year. Beyond the divisional and operational performances, just a brief comment on CapEx. During the first half, we invested close to 30 million uh, out of the total 100 million US that we planned for the year. Half of that CapEx has gone into research services, 30% into biologics, and the remainder into common infrastructure, safety-related improvements, replacement of old equipment, et cetera, digitization. And those splits are a reasonable indicator of what we'd expect for the full year. So let me summarize before I hand over to Sabadji. We made good progress on our strategic priorities over the first half. We started the year with strong revenue momentum, and this has continued into the second quarter. These are in a good position uh, with our first half performance. The first quarter performance with underlying revenue from operations growth of around 32% prompted us to upgrade our guidance for the full year. And the performance of the second quarter puts us solidly on tra track to achieve that upgraded revenue guidance of high teens for the year. With that, let me hand over to Sabaji. Thank you, Jonathan. And a very good morning to all of you. So good afternoon to all of you. Let me start with revenue performance, then take you through margins, profitability, and capex investments for the company. I'll give you a little color on the impact of currency as it benefited us in the quarter, and I'll also cover our current view on outlook for the full year FY23, which is both positive and is also reflective of the upgraded guidance given last quarter. With this context, I'll now cover the Q2 performance. Please note that you will, be, you will hear me referring to underlying performance in parts of my comments. Just to be clear, this is performance excluding the impact of remdesivir manufacturing. We recorded high sales of remdesivir during the first half of FY22, with most of it in the first quarter. As no remdesivir sales have been recorded in the first half of FY23, we think it is helpful to exclude remdesivir from both periods to illustrate the underlying performance of the ongoing business. As you heard from Jonathan, reported revenue from operations for the second quarter grew by 26% versus the same quarter last year. Underlying revenue growth, that is excluding remdesivir, was stronger at around 31%, which we believe is a very good performance. As a reminder, the first quarter also delivered a strong underlying revenue growth of around 32%. At constant exchange rate, our underlying growth for the quarter, net of remdesivir was around 22%. So irrespective of which measure of revenue growth is used, we 
see a very positive momentum in the business. I'll now move to EBITDA for quarter. EBITDA from operations, that is excluding interest income for the quarter, came in at Rs. 217 crores compared to Rs. 177 crores in the same quarter last year. That's up by around 22%. The reported EBITDA margin for the quarter was at 29.6% versus 30.5% of last year. And the operating EBITDA margin, which is without other income, was at 28.2% for the quarter compared to 29.1% last year. The quarter was hedged at Rs. 78 per US dollar. The depreciation of the rupee versus US dollar strengthened the top line without commensurate benefit on the bottom line because we book hedge losses as a part of expenses. Our margin guidance for the year was given at the hedge exchange rate. The optics of the EBITDA margin changed due to the average realized rate being around 80 rupees per US dollar in the second quarter, which is reflected in the top line. Normalized for the revenue at the hedge rate for both the years, the operating EBITDA margin for the quarter was at 28.9% as compared to 28.6% in the same quarter last year. I'll now cover other cost line items within the PNL. Material costs for the quarter increased by 19% year on year. As a percentage of revenue from operations, it was at 25.9% compared to 27.5% last year. The last year being high due to raw materials for render series. The current material cost is below the 27% guidance shared previously, and this will move up to the guidance level within the, with the increasing share of manufacturing in our revenue. During the quarter, the staff cost increased by 15% year on year and was at 28.4% of revenue from operations as compared to 31% in the second quarter of last year. The year on year increase is in line with the increase in headcount and reflects salary increases and changes in the mix of the employee base. Our direct cost, which is primarily, which primarily includes power and utility costs, increased 39% year on year, and is now at 3.7% of the revenue from operations for the com quarter compared to 3.4% for the corresponding period in the previous year. The increase is mainly on account of higher fuel prices for natural gas use for steam generation and high-speed diesel use for power backup. In the current environment, we are seeing the benefit of our investments in renewable energy companies, which not only reduces the energy supply, but also reduces our carbon emissions and consequently our impact on the environment. Despite an increase in consumption due to expansion of facilities and increasing power and fuel tariffs, these investments provide us a mechanism to control cost increases. Other expenses, which include travel, conveyance, repairs, and maintenance, digitization, automation, and selling expenses increase by 32% year on year. This increase is in line with the expectation and guidance given at the beginning of the year. As we came out of pandemic restrictions from Q4 last year, global travel and sales execution activities have picked up, nearing the pre-pandemic levels. This, along with other operating investments, including expansion of commercial teams, acceleration of digitization, and automation projects across the business also led to higher costs on a year on year basis. Hedge losses during the quarter were it is 19 crores, reflecting the difference between average spot rate during the quarter to the hedge rate. This is compared to the hedge gain of rupees 10 crores in quarter two of the previous year. Other income for the period increased from rupees 12.9 crores to rupees 15.4 crores, an increase of 20% on the back of increasing yield on investments and fixed deposits. Overall, reported EBITDA for the quarter was up by 22% year on year to rupees 232 crores compared to rupees 190 crores for the same period last year. Underlying EBITDA growth broadly tracked the top line growth, reflecting the operating leverage in the business. Depreciation and amortization for the period was at rupees 90 crores compared to rupees 76 crores in the same period last year. This increase of 18% on a year on year basis is mainly owing to the new investments in the last 12 months. The finance cost increased from rupees 1.2 crores to rupees 11.7 crores. Here we recognize the interest component on newly leased facilities as per the accounting standard IS 116, in addition to increase in interest rate on borrowings and translation losses on forex loans due to rupee depreciation. You should note that a large part of a loan is covered through interest rate swaps and hence does not get impacted by movement in interest rate, but is still impacted from the translation losses on the currency. Profit before tax increase by 15 year on year, the lower growth as compared to EBITDA and EBIT is on account of higher interest rates and currency translation losses. The effective tax rate for the quarter was about 21.5% compared to 18.5% during the same period last year. You will remember that I have previously told you that 
there will be a gradual increase in tax base as some of our units come out of the increase tax benefit period, and an increasing share of business is coming out, coming from locations not enjoying its benefits. Profit after tax before exceptional items to that rupees 102 crores as compared to 92 crores last year, and that's a growth of around 11%. Now moving to results for the half year, revenue from operations grew by 17%, including the impact of remdesivir in the base. Underlying revenue growth was 32%, excluding remdesivir, and on constant currency basis, underlying revenue growth for fast stuff was at 23%. EBITDA for the period grew at 14% year-on-year, and the underlying EBITDA from operations grew at 31%, in line with the underlying revenue growth, reflecting a strong first half of the year. Petrol cost adjusted for remdesivir impact in the base tracked the revenue growth. Staff cost increased by 14% in line with headcount growth. Other direct costs and other expenses increased by 48 and 38% respectively, driven by inflationary pressures, resumption of activities post-pandemic, and other operating investments expanded earlier. EBITDA margin from operation was around 28%, which was 90 basis points lower than last year due to the rupee depreciation effect on the top line as explained previously. Normalizing the revenue at hedge rate for the respective years, the EBITDA margin for the first half was similar to that of the previous year. CapEx for the first six months of the year was around US dollar 30 million. Another 50% of the CapEx guidance of 100 million has been put into execution and the same will be reflected in the books over the next few quarters. Based on the first half results, and the overall trajectory of the business, we confirm the guidance for the full year of high teams, revenue growth, and EBITDA margin of around 30%. PAT growth, as guided before, is expected to be in single digits, due to increase in effective tax rates and baseline effect of rent by 22. With this, I complete my commentary and will hand back to the moderator for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. In order to ensure the management is able to answer all queries, kindly restrict your questions to two at a time. We will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. We have a first question from the line of Tarang Agrawal from Old Bridge Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, Jonathan. Harsha Hi, everyone. Uh, congratulations for extremely robust set of numbers. Two questions from my side and probably one small suggestion. Uh, the first is uh, on the dedicated uh, uh, business. Uh, so, you know, over the last six, eight months, there's been a lot of news flow around uh, the international innovators coming and setting up their GCCs uh, in India. I mean, uh, yesterday there's something around Baxter, Herbalife's gone back and set its own um, center, and Pfizer, Merck, so on and so forth, uh, in Chennai, in, in Bangalore, and in Ahmedabad. Uh, while it, it does uh, put out a great sort of a story for India, uh, I'm not sure how, uh, uh, you know, whether it's really a positive or a negative development uh, from a Sinjin perspective, and how are you seeing this? Super, good question. Um, I mean, I can give you a specific. You mentioned Baxter. Um, the, the announcement they made earlier this week or last week is not new news. They've, they've had a, a center in India for a considerable amount of time, and that's actually our relationship with them is with that center. That's our partner, is part of their global network, including their India operations. So we're, 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 we're deeply sort of operationally integrated and used to working with that. So I, I, I get the question. I don't really see it as uh, an inflection point or an either or. Some clients um, often, if they've got big operational businesses in India already, and they're quite globalized, are very comfortable setting up their centers. It doesn't stop them from working with us on other aspects of our business. Um, uh, others like that, having a strong local partner that really operates well at scale um, is beneficial to them. I mean, the scale we're at, I'm sure we find it a little easier to recruit 
and, and, and operate in India than many standalone startups would. So I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly disturbed by it, and actually with just about every company that you mentioned, the fact they have a center in India actually just makes them more comfortable dealing in this part of the world, and they, they know us, they know us well, and we operate well with them. Okay. Does that make, make sense? Yes, it does. Um, the second, uh, you know, uh, pertaining to your discovery and development business uh, and the, the way we are seeing global trends, um, a lot of emerging biopharma companies have been in it, and that's uh, basically uh, one of the biggest reasons why, um, you know, businesses like yours are there helping them uh, come come up with cutthroat innovation. But at the same time, we're also seeing uh, uh, funding for a lot of these businesses drying up, uh, given uh, the macros that the world is facing. Uh, so from your perspective, typically while onboarding a client or getting into an engagement, uh, how do you, uh, you know, how do you track the credit risk that's associated because your relationship would perhaps continue for multiple years? So if you could just explain us that piece. Yeah, super. I mean, I'll make a general comment and I'll look to Sabadji to talk about the specific approach we take to credit risk. Um, it counterintuitively, the tightening of the funding environment, particularly in the U.S. biotech, uh, and it wouldn't be obvious, has driven, I think, a positive for us. Those companies that are sitting on you know, multiple years of cash but are concerned about their cash burn rate and their ability to refinance at some future milestone, if they've got cash, and there are a lot that are like that, you know, that are already well-funded, of course, remember that the, the, the observation you're making is we've been through two or three years of a very, very healthy funding environment for biotechs, and that market now has slowed and dipped. Those that, that took funding during the, the, those boom years are sitting on cash, and they now want to find out how, the, how can they make that last longer and deliver all of their science. Well, one of the obvious things they can do is partner with a business like Syngene that, offer eight, uh, that offers a very good operating cost arbitrage. And for many of them, they could spend their money in the U.S. or they could triple the runway of their cash burn and come and partner with us. And they wouldn't notice a difference in the quality of science and the quality of innovation because we operate right at those global standards. But, th but that's the sort of more macro strategic comment. And then, Sabadji, just on the specifics, I mean, we, we follow the normal rigorous protocols any business would about checking the credit worthiness of your counterparts. Yeah, thanks, Arthur. And uh, hi, Saran. Uh, speaking particularly about how we approach this issue, we do uh, engage with uh, emerging biopharma and biotech. However, um, we do have a very well-structured credit policy and a credit approach. We have multiple categories based on uh, size of the company, market cap, profitability, or, and, and uh, whatever information that we can gather for those companies. And we do have a risk rating at our end. And uh, for customers where uh, based on the credit rating, we do uh, ask for advances. So I think our credit policy was structured and very robust to handle a situation like that. Over the last six eight months, we haven't really seen any impact. In fact, uh, you know, we our, we have been uh, uh, getting um, uh, receivables as normal, which is um, uh, which is basically saying that our credit policy is working and uh, is very effective. So, while I understand the question, at this point, no concern from me. Got it. Yeah, and the only other comment I'd say is is that the, the actual the, the, the history has been a, a very positive one. It's not an area that we've had a lot of concern, but that doesn't mean to say you don't remain sensible and vigilant. Thank you. Got it. Uh, just the last, uh, I mean, the qualitative commentary on each of the businesses is uh, helpful and it helps us get some sense. But going forward, would it be possible to give us some more, say, detailed quantitative numbers uh, across, say, maybe a revenue segmentation or something else? I mean, say, how many molecules you've got in phase one, two, or three without, you know, naming the customers or, uh, you know, uh, but some more maybe detailed numbers would probably be helpful. 
uh, for us to get a better handle on the business. Otherwise, uh, the disclosures are great. So this was just the last suggestion. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm always happy to receive helpful suggestions. Do talk to the IR team about things that you think would be helpful. Um, by the way, that's not an irrevocable commitment that everything you should suggest is something that we're automatically going to be able to do, but very happy to have the dialogue. I, I mean, I, I would actually go back, and if you look at the, the, the extent and breadth of our disclosures, particularly on these quarterly calls, compare where we are today, we were, we were, say, five years ago. Qualitatively, I think you get an awful lot more information than, than you used to, um, and, and we're trying very hard to sort of paint a narrative without necessarily breaking down the inner workings of all of our P&L. You, you, you get um, our P&L on the basis that management runs it to, so there's an alignment there. But very happy always to give you a comment. Do talk to the IR team if you've got good suggestions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A reminder to participants to press star and one to ask a question. We have a next question from the line of Surya Patra from Philip Capital. Please. Yeah, uh, congratulations for the great set of numbers. Uh, my first question is on about the uh, the incremental collaboration, Jonathan, that you have mentioned in your opening remark, uh, leveraging the advantage of the Synvent. So if you can uh, elaborate a bit, you have uh, said some number also that uh, uh, multiple uh, collaborations that has been added using this Sylvan platform. So if you can elaborate number of customers or the project that has been added uh, in during the quarter or let's say even last one year period. And uh, whether this European situation, what currently that we are witnessing that is uh, that is uh, bringing in positive uh, these things uh, vibes to our business, or how is it that impacting us? Say a bit more just on that, because I, I, what do you mean by the European situation? So, like it could it could bring two impact right to us. Uh, see, in terms of uh, it, possibly it could bring incremental manufacturing opportunity. Uh, that is one, and possibly help us uh, filling our CMO facility quicker. That is one. And um, on the other hand, so since there are uh, war issues are going on, and uh, uh, the clinical trials could be deferred, and hence uh, the possible near-term impact could be there negative, negatively to us. So Let, let, let's come back to that. I'll, I'll give you. I'll talk a little bit about Synvent, and then maybe if you could, if, while I'm doing that, have a think. I, I'm not sure I understand fully the question, but it's the bit you said. Did I hear you correctly? The, this European situation. I, I don't know what you're referring to. That's why I'm struggling with the question. Okay. So I'm saying, uh, see, practically there are uh, there are energy challenges, there are uh, war situations impacting the clinical trials and all that. So hence, uh, possibly the supply is what we would be making, the development quantities and all that. Uh, okay, possibly. sorry. So, no, I get it. Thank you. Thank you. So geopolitics, basically. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, given that um, I spend a fair proportion of my time living in Europe, working there, um, yeah. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize it as you just did. I, I'm not sure that we are seeing operational impact in the industry, clinical trials not happening. Remember, the situation's in Ukraine, and I mean, it, 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 clearly it's a travesty for the people of U Ukraine, and I wouldn't comment more on, on the politics of it. But I, I, I don't think it is flooding through the rest of Europe and the other, I think, European Union, 850 million people falling within that as a, a trading bloc. Um, so I don't see the operational impact. Go back to Synvent, though, but that I am happy to talk about. Um, yeah. So let me just make sure that we, we all understand what it is. One of the things that we've seen as, as our industry, the CRO services, particularly businesses like Syngene over the last 20, 30 years, uh, have matured, increased the sophistication of what we do. We've become actually increasingly like our clients, if our clients are the world's leading life sciences innovation companies. And, and, and what I mean by that is by... If you observe this by capability, by infrastructure, by the processes we follow, 
by the way we go about doing science, we now sit, I think, at a par with the operations and the innovation that you'd see inside the leading companies around capabilities. That's created, I think, a second market opportunity. The primary one for us is functional services, where we do something like chemistry or biology, and we insert that into the value chain of our clients, and they do the other things around it. So they do the step before and the step after, but we are a component in their value chain. Synvent is really as offering the fully integrated value chain as a service on demand to clients that want to do it, either because they want to put an additional project outside of their own operations. Let's say they've got more good ideas than they've got capacity. They will do some of those projects in their own labs, but they still want to put other ones outside. And we can offer that fully integrated as a, as a service. Or you, 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 you've got others that just want to maybe accelerate, or they've got a virtualized business model. They never actually intend, while, while investing in innovation, to own the infrastructure. So for that, we offer a turnkey solution. So that's the essence of Synvent, is that it's a, a fully integrated drug hunting, drug discovery, drug development platform series of interlinked, interconnected services. Um, and then the number that I mentioned was that we were up to 18 projects. The baseline of that, of course, would be effectively zero from when we launched that, that whole service to the market, I'd have to think, two, three years ago, um, around that time frame. And we continue to add projects to it, and we see good demand. Does that help? At least that paints a yeah. picture of how it differs from Syngene and Synvent. Think of Syngene as component verticalized services and think of Synvent as the same things flip through 90 degrees and therefore horizontally integrated as a, as a value stream. Sure. Uh, so this is really helpful. Uh, one additional extended thing here that I'm just trying to understand. See, you, you do mention also the universities that you have tied up with. So here I'm trying to understand whether this, these uh, associations with universities are uh, for uh, sourcing projects or uh, uh, business opportunities, or it is to build our capabilities with the help of university support. I think it's all of those. It's, a, it's an integrated one, and, and sources of talent as well. I mean, we, 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 we like to have a close and symbiotic relationship with many of the leading universities in India. Um, you know, I, I'd love every chemistry professor and every biology professor to know that the brightest and the best in their class are very welcome uh, to, to come and start their scientific career at Syngene. And if they know us and we know them, there's more chance of that happening. Um, the other bit is being a super smart academic scientist it adds value to super smart, for want of a better phrase, industrial scientists, and there's a good relationship between them. So, again, we create value intellectually at that interface, as well as they may well be sources of good ideas, good ideas for our clients, innovation, blue sky research. So uh, it, it's, it's a connected sort of community. And we, we intend to play an active part of that in India, which is why we've increased the number of universities we have relationships with. And, you know, we, we, we welcome that. It's a good source of talent, good source of innovation. Sure, sir. Just last one question about the uh, clarification about the tax rate, what Sibaji sir has mentioned. So, uh, uh, so uh, do you say that, okay, now whatever tax rate we are currently witnessing for the quarter, it is kind of a likely rate for uh, future also? So, uh, Surya, I, what I said is that the effective tax rate for this current financial year is around 21.5%. And uh, over the next uh, three to five years, it will gradually move up to 25%. That's the kind of cap we are looking forward to. Um, so uh, that's how we can model a gradual increase. Sure. However, I have to clarify one thing. This does not have a cash flow impact because yeah. we have had enough advance tax paid in terms of MAT for the next three to four years till the time we reach FY25, 26 to kind of adjust against the opening tax credit that we have. So it's more about the P&L impact. 
from FY25, 26, we can gradually then assume that uh, the cash tax, tax payout will also start going closer to 25%. That's how we can model it. That's just a modeling input, but uh, from a PNL perspective, ETR has been 21.5, gradually it'll move up to 25%. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to ensure the management is able to answer all queries, kindly restrict your questions to two at a time. We have our next question from the line of Harib Ahmed from Spark Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity. On, on the Zoetis contract, uh, you mentioned that uh, there were some qualification batches uh, supplied during the quarter. So qualitatively, can you give some color on whether this was a big contributor to the overall revenues for the quarter and, and uh, whether it was a major contribution to our uh, uh, you know, manufacturing services revenues? And then uh, no. do we expect this to sustain in the third quarter? No, that's the shortest answer I think I've ever given on a call. No, it wasn't. So I, I, I don't, don't, if, you think that the, if you think the numbers for the quarter were good, I mean, they came in pretty much a beat versus market consensus on each line of the p and it, it isn't Zoetis that's driving that. It's the rest of the business. Uh, Zoetis really won't come online until next year. So you, you, know, you, you should be adjusting your models to think about that as an engine coming on stream from the first quarter of next year. Between now and then, there, there's, there's bits and bobs and there's qualification work and there's a regulatory a series of regulatory inspections to be cleared. But from a capital markets revenue point of view, um, dial it in for the 1st of April and, and, and not before then. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, Adit, we have uh, indicated that we are seeing good demand uh, situation in biologics. And we also said in our last call, the commercial manufacturing will start sometime in last quarter of this financial year, which is what Jonathan is also saying. Actually, uh, revenue from commercial manufacturing will start showing up fully on the next financial year. Till that, we may have some small revenue contribution from uh, uh, trial batches, but nothing significant in the world of chemo things. Okay. And, and this product, uh, if I understood correctly, uh, has been launched in Europe. Uh, so any takeaways uh, from from uh, the performance there and the ramp up there so far uh, in terms of uh, how the yeah, I, 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 uptake I, I, can I, be in the U.S.? I'll give you a yeah, I'll give you a qualitative answer, but it, it, it's it, that's a much better question to put to Zoetis. I mean, that's the bread and butter of uh, of their business. It's a it's a marquee product in their industry. It's a real source of innovation. Everything I see tells me it, it, it's getting good traction in the market. But re really, it, you know, we're at, at a different point in the supply chain to be the best people to comment on in market performance. I mean, that that's an issue for them really to comment on. Um, but it, you know, it looks to be a very successful product, and if you read the scientific data, um, it looks good. And, and, and uh, uh, in terms of uh, inspection timelines uh, by the FDA, uh, so uh, you know, uh, just trying to understand if uh, you know this is likely to happen in the second, second half, half of, of 23. Second half and, of the uh, yeah, second half of this year, and uh, uh, second half of the year is my expectation, but I. I I, I don't drive the FDA schedule. They'll do, um, and you know we'll we'll let you know when the outcome when we know the outcome. Um, but I, I think I think you've got a fairly clear sort of framework. Zoetis wasn't the the, the 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 cause of the positive performance in the second quarter and the first quarter of this year. It's the rest of the business that's driving that. Um, between now and the end of this financial year, our expectation is to come to go through and hopefully complete successfully the various regulatory inspections that are needed. Assuming that happens, then we'll be into starting commercial scale manufacturing in the fourth quarter of this year, which should, given how long it takes to do a batch, should start to become a, a revenue factor from the first quarter. So I, I think there's a sequential story and you've got all the moving parts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. That's all for my back. A reminder to participants to press star and one to ask a question. We have our next question from the line of Mehul Shade from Access Capital. Please go ahead. 
Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. So, first question on uh, your visibility towards uh, order book. So, are you getting any uh, incremental order uh, inquiries, uh, even uh, likely uh, like market from US or the Europe side? Uh, given this, uh, the uh, looking for some China plus one strategy. So, are you getting any incremental uh, inquiries? Yeah, I think that's a sort of a general structural trend, but I'm not sure I can pass it out. If you think, depends what your baseline is, um, the world is, is just starting to come out of a pandemic. So uh, if you ask, if your question is phrased as, are you seeing a change from where we were a year ago, two years ago? I think the answer is going to be yes for everything and everybody because the world's coming out of lockdown. What I tried to get to in my comments was that in our industry, remember for most, nearly all of our customers, economically, something that's absolutely central to their business models is creating innovation that's patentable. And those patents are time-bound monopolies, effectively, it's the definition of, of a patent. And that leaves you with an industry that speed and speed through discovery into development to the market is absolutely vital. So if you've just been through a two-year pandemic period where things have slowed down, gone more slowly, been delayed, there's a real economic spur on the client side to try and make up for lost ground. And I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing quite a buoyant demand market um, around the world as people are back, back to work. Not only are they doing what they weren't doing because they weren't at work, but they're trying to catch up on things that got delayed. Does it, does that, uh, hopefully that gives you enough of a sense certainly gives you the tonality that um, would be experienced in the first half of the year, a, a positive demand environment. I, I look forward to reporting on how that plays out in the rest of the year. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Uh, and one question on Mangalore plant. So once uh, you, you, are, you are expecting a, a commissioning or a commercialization by second half uh, next year, but uh, there will be some incremental cost or operating cost that will be currently there you must be incurring. So what will be the impact of that incremental cost related to this plant on your EBITDA, if you can quantify the quarterly run rate or something? Okay. Um, I'm looking at Subhaji, whether you have a comment. What my headline comment would be, in a business of our size with the number of subunits, operating units, we wouldn't pass out the EBITDA in impact of a particular plant or a particular supply point, um, largely because I don't think it would be helpful. We wrap all of that up in our overall guidance. Yes. And the guidance we gave for the year um, is EBIT, EBITDA margins of around 30% for the full year. We are a little bit below that in the first, uh, in the second quarter, which implies a few hundred basis points of uplift in the rest of the year. But no, no big deal, really. I think around 30% yeah. is stable. So you. And 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 uh, as we mentioned before, the margin is a bit behind because of the uh, rupee depreciation benefit that we're getting in uh, on the top line. If you adjust for that, we are almost close to the guidance, and uh, hopefully by the when we look at the full year numbers, we'll be on guidance. But uh, uh, yes, the expenses of Bangalore plant is very much built in on overall expenses, but we do not like to call out the exact numbers over there. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That, uh, that's it for my side. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question for today. I now hand the conference over to Ms. Avantika Mishra from EY for closing comments. Over to you. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's call. I hope we have answered your questions. If there are any further queries, please do get in touch with our team and we will be happy to get back to you. Have a good day and thank you again. On behalf of Sinjin International Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us and you may now disconnect your lines.